Hello and welcome to this video. This video is going to be called Why Ringo is Really Great. Okay, I've just done a, um, a video about the Beatles. I love the Beatles. Um, when I was a kid I didn't like the Beatles. I was into heavy rock and prog and all the heavy stuff and I didn't get the Beatles when I was young. And I think a lot of people don't get the Beatles. Um, as I got older I really got into them and I started to see how incredible they are. And they, they really truly are, they're, they're incomparable. There's no other band that you can really compare to them for a whole bunch of reasons. Now, um, on the internet, there's a discussion that crops up quite a bit where people start to argue whether Ringo was any good or not. This idea that Ringo was the sort of non-musician in the Beatles or the rest were geniuses and he was just towing along and that's, you know, this, this quote you often hear that Ringo wasn't even the best drummer in the Beatles and all this type of stuff and I, I've gone through many arguments on the internet trying to argue why Ringo was so great but I really do think he's great and I'm going to talk a little bit of why I think he's so great on, on this video. So um, on the Beatles video I was just shot I, I explained a concept that's that I think is the case is that, um, and I'm going to go over that again, and then I'll get into some specific things with Ringo that the why I think he was so important. But um, the Beatles emerge in Liverpool. Um, they're kids; they know each other. It really is that sort of story of kids meeting each other as teenagers and forming a band and taking over the world. They they are the best example of that in history. They're listening to lots of rhythm and blues, rock and roll. They're into skiffle. Skiffle was a sort of British take on American folk music um, using homemade instruments. And it was almost like 1950s version of punk because it allowed a lot of musicians access to music making who, who didn't have the technical skill on the instrument and also couldn't afford the instruments in the first place. You know, so rather than play double bass, they would make a bass out of a broom handle and a piece of string and they'd stick it on a tea chest and they'd bend it back and get the pitch like that. You know, people would create, you know, drums out of um, kitchen implements and sort of this. And this, this really was hugely important in England in bringing a whole bunch of musicians um, into music that then went on to become, you know, very important in the history of rock and roll. Those of you who like Led Zeppelin, if you go and search on the YouTube, you will find a video of Jimmy Page as a very young boy on a television documentary talking about his skiffle band. You know, so a lot of these people started off with skiffle, and the Beatles did. Um, they developed their craft through that. They formed a band. They then got gigs out in Hamburg. They went out there and played every single day for something like 12 hours a day or whatever it was. And they became very skilled just through playing live and, and being able to deliver to an audience. Um, they're writing great songs. They've studied songwriting. They've got they're they're fantastic. And the record companies discover this. They get signed. They get taken into the studio. And when they get in there, George Martin, the producer, turns around and says, "Well, th this is great, but your drummer's not cutting it." And anybody who goes and listens to the recordings that they made with Pete Best can hear that Pete Best was a, a pretty good drummer, but he wasn't a pro level drummer. He wasn't able to really hold it down in the studio with the consistency, the timing, the right choice of beats, the right placement of fills in a live situation, which was the way they recorded back then, and nail it. And the, that, the reason for that is no criticism against Pete Best. Many drummers can't do that. That's a highly skilled thing. So the Beatles go, right, we need to get another drummer. So they go back to Liverpool and they pick the best guy there, which is Ringo Starr. Ringo Starr's done session in all sorts of bands. Now, if you're doing sessions, that means you have to learn how to please the client. You have to deliver what they want. Then you go to the next session and you deliver the next thing that they want. That requires technical skill. That requires a vocabulary. Ringo had that. And Ringo's great achievements um, in, in popular music was that he was able to create the foundation, perhaps, perhaps the greatest rock pop band of all time. He nailed it. All right? Now... Um, it is a criticism that Ringo, when he went into the studio, played for the song. That he didn't show off. That he gave the song what was required and nothing more. Well, I would argue that that is the final stage of mastery on the instrument. Right? Um, good drummers, you can tell they're good. 
the great drummers you can't. Good drummers show their technique off. It's apparent to you. The great drummers, you can't hear the technique because it's so assimilated into the music. Now, um, I'm a drummer and uh, as I got older, I'd start to listen to Ringo on Beatles albums. And I'd notice that uh, there were certain rolls around the toms that were really, really fast. There were certain double-handed fills that were really, really quite difficult. There, there was um, an, a swing and a consistency that for me, to my ears, pointed that to this guy could really, really play and had some chops. Um, the single stroke roll is, is the real test of a drummer. You know, Buddy Rich would always end his solos by doing a single stroke roll, which is right left, right, and you'd hear that. And most drummers, you can tell their basic technique, you know, but Ringo would just bomb, you know, and you get these little rolls around the kits, you know, um, that, that were really incredible. Now, Ringo's left-handed and he's playing right, I think that's the case. And often left-handed drummers have a strength that they're leading with their right hand, but their left hand is very strong, and this gives them a sort of multi-directional approach to the drums. I can hear that in Ringo's playing. So my argument is I think Ringo was a very, very good drummer, that he had good technique, right? Now, what's happening on the internet with Ringo is he's been judged by standards that are 60 years later. And that this is completely unfair. And I'm, I'm going to tell you the story of how Ringo works in the history of pop music. So Ringo's a great drummer. He comes in, provides the foundation to the Beatles. They're the greatest sort of rock pop band of the time. Um, the Beatles' success is unparalleled. There, there has never been a band ever anywhere near the, the success of the Beatles. Um, the Beatles take over the UK. They start to get every hit record going. They go to the States. They appear on the Ed Sullivan Show and the whole America goes mad, right? Um, up until then, pop music is an American form, okay? Uh, America dominates pop music in the same way it, it, it dominates to this day the film industry, you know. Um, the Beatles actually changed that. This is an incredible achievement, is that they come and they actually now place Britain at the centre of popular music, all right? And the centre of popular music that is created by bands. One of the things that I find very interesting is if you go into a room, and I've done this with my students, they go, right, who are the greatest artists in, in music history? You've got Elvis Presley, uh, Madonna, Prince, Michael Jackson. All those pop artists, that's the very American way of approaching pop music is you have the artist, you know, this goes right back to Frank Sinatra and all those types. The Beatles are a band, right? And their bandness is so important to their success. Um, and Ringo plays a part in that. The, the four personalities of the band are absolutely in, very important because although the Beatles are playing American sort of rhythm of blues and rock and roll right at the start. They've infused that with a sort of English song tradition which has come from the music hall, which is the Cheeky Chappy, and they're four Cheeky Chappies, and I know that's so important to that. Now, this, this doesn't make um, Ringo a good drummer, but what it does is it, it shows that their success and the, the cultural um, spotlight that's put on them, they're changing culture, the fact that Everyone knows Ringo, they, they identify Ringo because he's, he's one of the Beatles. So when he played on the Ed Sullivan show, a thousand drummers were born. There's, there's drummers of a certain age, right, who started playing because of Ringo on that show. I've met them, millions of them, <laughs> right? These are some of the guys that laid the foundation for rock music and jazz and fusion and prog. They started because they saw Ringo, okay? Now Ringo, is actually pioneering something, okay? And, I, and, I, and I, I don't know where this is coming from, but in rock and roll, rock and roll starts of a sort of swing form like jazz. But because of people like Fats Domino with that 16 note boogie woogie style, 16th notes start to creep in. And rock and roll's often very interesting because the feel is a mixture of, of 16th note straight playing and swing, all right? Um, drummers like Earl Palmer are absolutely 
so important to the development of this, this sound. And Ringo is obviously aware of that sound, but what Ringo does is he fattens up the backbeat. And he plays such a huge part in moving from a you know that sort of rock and roll to Ringo is, is one I'm not going to say he's the only creator of that but I would say as a single influence he's probably the most important guy there is in creating a, a, a backbeat you listen to James Brown before the Beatles or when James Brown first emerged and he's swinging Right, by the end of the um, you know, 60s, he's, he's playing straight with a backbeat. This is, this is Ringo. So Ringo does have this huge influence. Not only is he playing for the song and creating this um, incredible foundation, but he's pioneering a foundation. Okay? He's pioneering a way of playing which is, in, is really taking the focus between the snare drum and the bass drum. All right? Um, a lot of the time when you hear Ringo on, on later Beatles tracks, he's taken out the hi-hats all together and it, it all, he's, he's just backbeat. So often you'll just hear him going, plat, 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 like that. And, and when you look at Ringo's approach on the later records, it's absolutely incredible, right? And it's all to do with choice, okay? So those out there who know nothing about drumming, and they're sat there listening to their modern heavy metal records where somebody has programmed beats or at least they've played it in the studio and it's been quantized and resampled and all that so much that it really is no drummer and they're listening to someone doing bass drums at a million miles an hour and playing around the kit and listening to that and judging Ringo by that standard all I can say is that style of drumming is there because Ringo did stuff in the 60s which created a uh, a revolution in drumming and drummers then came in afterwards influenced by Ringo and they built upon what he'd done and 60 years later that has advanced and advanced and advanced so there's a whole bunch of techniques that Ringo doesn't do but he's the he's the actual father he's the originator of this and you're judging him by that you're saying oh we can't play this Phil he can't do this he can't play like this drummer right this is not understanding what makes a drummer great. So we're into the last five minutes of this video, okay? A drummer goes through three stages. The first stage is a sort of technical, physical motor school stage where they have to hold the sticks right and be able to play in, you know, play in time, do single stroke rolls, double stroke rolls. It's, it's a motor school thing. And, and many drummers that are stuck at that phase, that's all they're, they're aware of. So they're judging Ringo in that way. Later on, once you've got that, then you have to develop a vocabulary so that you can play lots of different styles, you can, you can respond to the situation in the room. This is the second stage of learning the drums. The final stage is making that all go away. It's absolute mastery, right? And, and what that is, is to be able to play exactly the right thing at the right time. That is the highest skill on any instrument. Okay, so a few years ago I played with um, Robert Plant. Now I do have a lot of chops and technique and vocabulary on the drums. I've been playing for a long time. I've grown up with Mr. Billy Carbum and Arthur Michael Walden and Wickle and Vinnie and Terry Bozio and, and I've come out of that thing. So, so I've got a ton of chops and I can play stuff. You know, I can sit down and play beats by Steve Gadd and Vinnie and all that type of thing. And I end up in the room with Robert Plant. And he says, Andy, have you got a beat for this song? And I play him a beat. Now, at that point, you are faced with the hardest thing because I've got to come up with something creative. So I played him a beat because, oh, that's not quite right. And he said, oh, and I can remember he said, I wish I could tell you what I want, but I don't really know what I want. And it became very apparent that this is a guy that was used to having John Bonham sat at the back and going, John, have you got a beat? And he comes up with when the levy breaks. <laughs> And I realised that all the chops and technique and ability to play this fast stuff, that, that means nothing, right? Right? What, uh, what is the highest thing is being able to come for the right beat at the right time. Now, Ringo was not only a genius at this, 
but so often he would do what you didn't expect. So go and listen to I Am The Warrus. I am we and you are Now if I was in the room, I would have been going, bass ass, tear down, bump, bump, tear down, bump, bump, bump. That's what I would have done, the cliche that everyone does. Does Ringo do that? No, he just plays the floor tom. Dum, 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 dum. He cuts directly to what the music is about. Directly, right? This is what makes him truly great. That skill is so few and far between. You know, being able to play for the song, right? Being able to pick the right beat, but, but come up with things that you, no one else would normally come up with. That is the sign of true greatness. Some drummers are able to do that with a whole ton of techniques. I believe that drummers like Steve Gadd and Billy Cobham and Vinnie Colaiuta, they're able to do that with a whole ton of chops, but other drummers don't. Now, do we put those in a different category? Well, I'm gonna to have to tell you another Robert Plant story is that um, many years later, I, I was sat um, do, working on some demos for Robert for, for an album and he, he, was, he was using me to come up with ideas for the drums. And he gave me something that I felt was too simplistic, right? Um, and I said to him, you know, are you sure about this? Could it really just sound just like, I remember saying, it sounds like George of the Jungle. And he laughed and he says, that's what I want, George of the Jungle. And he turned around and told me something that has stuck in my mind. And he said to me, Andy, you're a good drummer, but you've, you'll always be working for somebody like me. Right? And that means you need to deliver what I want. And he said, um, which means what I want is for the drums to disappear within the song. So he, he said more than this, but I've sort of condensed down and I've paraphrased. So I hope I've got this right. Because at the time when he told it me, I was a bit like, what does he mean? What does he mean? And I went away and thought, and I, and I realized what he was saying was that drummers are often trying to play in a way even if they're playing something simple, where they still can shine. There's that little bit of groove, there's that back beat, there's that cool fill. But actually, true masters on the drums, and these are the session greats that you are not aware of, what they're able to do is to be able to, to play in a way where they're, they're drumming and their, their um, statement absolutely disappears within the song. There's no rough edges at all. Sometimes records are great because we notice the drums. But often, what's required of the drummer is to actually disappear. Right? And that's to do with the sound of the drums, the feel of the drums. You know, you want to make, might want to play that backbeat and have it really sticking out or play a groove. You might want to groove and make the people dance. But actually, the songs are not about making people dance. It's making them feel the beat, but in, in a way that relates to the meaning of the song. So many of the great session drummers, when I've asked their advice, have said, you know, what, what's your, your, can you give me some advice to playing on sessions? And they've said, yeah, first thing you do is, is look at the lyrics and work out the meaning of the song, and then play the meaning of the song. Well, if that's what truly makes a drummer great, then Ringo is without doubt one of the greatest drummers that's ever lived, right? Did he? have to sacrifice um, his own ego for that? Did he have to play in a way and disappear in those songs to make those songs the absolute classics, timeless classics that they are? Did he have to sacrifice a little bit of showboating? You know, every moment where he could, oh, I can do this cool feel, oh, I do this cool run here, I, I can do this showy off a bit. Perhaps he's truly great because he never did that. And he's now cursed for every drummer that doesn't know what they're talking to back to go, oh, he's not that good because he can't play like whoever it is. The guy from Animals as Leaders or Neil Peart or whatever it is that they think is fantastic drumming. And those are both fantastic drummers and I love them. But um, is that the payoff that Ringo made? Um, well, I'm sure he's pretty happy. <laughs> I'm sure he sat at home not worrying about it too much. Uh, but I do think he is truly one of the great drummers on, on so many different levels. Um, I haven't even began to scratch the surface of why I think he's great. I didn't want to get into this video of just going into every Beatles song and just saying, listen to that and you can hear that there and that there. You know, I didn't want to do that. But I hope I've sort of outlined um, why he is so good. And hopefully now you'll all stop criticising Ringo because I have spoken and explained it. Right, so... 
That's it, over. Internet, stop it. Leave Ringo alone. He's one of the greats. I said so. That's it. Um, if you like this video, then please like it. Um, if you like the channel, please subscribe. And please, if you feel so inclined, go pop over to my Patreon where there's loads more videos and they get much more weirder, weirder and wackier than this. And, uh, you know, support me in doing this because I love doing it, you know, and uh, I want to be able to do it more. So that is my video on Ringo Starr and I will see you on the next one. Thank you very much. Goodbye.